Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Thank you all for finding the time to listen and participate to this very important topic on the role of EdTech in achieving an inclusive education in, in COVID-19 times. My name is Kinda Shebi, and I'm Insight Manager at the GSMA. So today we'll be starting with a short presentation um, on the report we recently published, and we will then have a conversation um, with our key speakers um, shortly after. And please do not hesitate to use the Q&A uh, section that you see on the right um, so that we are able to direct your question during our discussion after the presentation. So for those who are not familiar with the GSMA, we represent the interests of mobile operators worldwide, uniting more than 700 mobile operators and nearly 400 companies in the broader mobile ecosystem, including handset and device makers, software companies, but also equipment providers and internet companies. The organization also produced the industry-leading Mobile World Congress events annually held um, in Barcelona, Los Angeles, Shanghai, as well as other regional conferences. Within the organization is our Mobile for Development arm, which works to reduce inequalities in our world. Mobile for Development has, as you can see, 10 different programs offering strong opportunities to see the area where mobile technology have critical impact on people's lives. Thank you. We have projects in more than 45 countries where we are actively working with mobile operators, innovators, NGOs, civil societies to drive actions and unearth new innovations. We are always looking for new insights, new data, um, which inform us to take stronger actions. To date, we have impacted the lives of 74.2 million people and counting. So the insights and findings I'll share shortly are from our newly launched report called Education for All in COVID Times, How EdTech Can Be Part of the Solution. The aim was to conduct a research on the impact of COVID on education and how uh, digital technologies can help sustain learning. So we kicked off the research uh, at the beginning of the lockdown in May uh, of this year, where school closure impacted learning worldwide, as we all know. By the, the end of the research, as schools started to reopen, we could see EdTech gradually moving from the main source of learning to a learning complement. So in the frame of this research, we uh, conducted key informant interviews with development partners, as well as NGOs, mobile operators, but also um, education technology startups, academics, and course teachers. Um, Please access the report via the barcode that you can see, um, and you also have the link. So the first thing that we are all aware of is that COVID-19 has magnified an education crisis that already existed in developing markets, whereby about 260 million children and youth were already out of school. It is important to consider the high socioeconomic costs closure and tell in developing countries, particularly for marginalized, margin, marginalized children. The so girls in particular are at risk. Um, it is estimated today that 10 million secondary age, school aged girls in developing countries may never return to any form of schooling due to in interrupted learning from COVID-19, lockdown in particular. Similarly, persons with disabilities are more likely to be excluded so here you can see um, UNESCO listing number of benefits. Um, I mean, the risk occurring if people were out of school. Those are risks of social, social isolations, but also increased violence in particular, as you can see. Uh, next slide, please. So there are currently 26 million refugees globally. Half of all refugees are children. Only three in five 
refugee children attend primary schools, and just 23% displaced young people have access to secondary education. So this is to show you that it is already challenging in, edu in developing markets to access education. It is even more challenging in uh, refugee settings. School closure due to COVID-19 lockdown have not only deprived the students in uh, refugee and conflict settings to access learning, but also it's often that it was often their only opportunity for safety, protection, and empowerment. Um, thank you. So the state of emergency in education has really spurred the innovation necessary to assess um, systemic challenges in developing markets. Now, there are opportunities for startups to respond to this unparalleled demand for edtech with innovative solutions, but countries and schools to unlock such advantages, um, there is a need for a robust ecosystem in place dedicated to what we call the equitable edtech. First of all, we need to have a viable business models um, to support innovative attack and ensure that both equitable access and um, equitable impact will be there. Secondly, ICT must um, be in place to optimize the distribution of attack, including internet access, attack hardware, telecommunication infrastructure, but also basic electricity. Thirdly, clear education policy and strategies should be in place at the local government level and supported with durable legislation and equitable education financing. Also, it is very important that collaboration between education stakeholders is there. And it should include educators, but also government, startup, NGOs, coalitions, but also school board members and city councils. Now, one technology that has accelerated the chance of equitable learning is the mobile technology. Its role in including vulnerable groups is particularly critical. Um, mobile helps bridge, first of all, gender gaps. It played an instrumental role in improving education opportunities for girls by providing a getaway to essential life-enhancing information and knowledge. The mobile gender gap is closing, and today in developing markets, 54% of women are currently mobile internet users, and this is up from 44% in 2017. The JSMA Connected Women Commitment Initiative has brought together 38 mobile operators since 2016 to enhance digital and financial inclusion for over 35 million women in those developing markets. Secondly, mobile helps improve digital literacy. Mobile operators are addressing the negative effect of low digital literacy on mobile internet adoptions by investing in, for example, public education and digital skills initiative. Um, it is very important as well to understand that mobile is really helping um, the needs of learners with disabilities. About a billion in the world live with disabilities, and 80% of those live in developing markets. So mobile technology has enhanced their participation to the society. Um, just to name one initiative, um, Turkcell has supported Otsimo, which is a social enterprise that has developed digital education platform for people with autism. They are serving today about 100,000 users in 168 countries really helping uh, learners with disabilities access education. So there's been tremendous progress, um, but we, we also need to be aware of the works. Um, sorry, you can go to the previous slide. Yes, so we need to be aware of, of the work that is still need to be done. 4G coverage is catching up with 3G. It's now account for more than 50% of mobile connections globally. In 2019, 82% of the population in developing markets were covered by 4G. However, the rural, urban, and gender gaps in, in mobile internet remain substantial, um, although it is narrowing. 
people living in rural areas in developing markets are 37% less likely to use mobile internet than, living, than those living in, in urban areas. Also, women are 20% less likely than men to use mobile internet, meaning that around 300 million fewer women than men uses mobile internet. So, smartphone has become more affordable, but handset affordability has been identified as the main barrier so far to mobile ownership in um, developing markets. The average cost of um, entry-level internet-enabled device fell from about 44% of monthly income um, in 2018 to 34% in, in 2019. Um, However, more progress needs to be done um, so that mobile data can become more um, affordable and um, is still a significant challenge for the poorest in society. Now, a lack of literacy and, and digital skills persist as the main barrier to use among mobile users who are aware of mobile internet, um, but are often you know, deprived from the main skills of um, uh, using it the, the right way or access education and really benefit from those digital tools. Next slide, please. Um, so how can EdTech help achieve an inclusive education in developing markets? First of all, there is an urgent need to train key stakeholders in the education systems um, in the new learning modality. So the next generation also needs to be uh, trained for the future of work, which will be shaped by um, digital transformations in all sectors. In Africa in particular, there is an opportunity for the private sector to invest in edtech and help educators reimagine their syllabus and to include job ready skills. The so recent World Economic Forum study urges African educators to design future ready curriculum that accelerate the acquisition of um, digital and STEM skills for you. Collaboration is also a very important part of um, EdTech success. Partnership involving civil society, private sector, and international organizations um, such as UNESCO Global Coalition are really key. Another powerful partnership that I would like to mention is the one involving the GSMA, the World Bank, World Economic Forum, via um, the Joint Action Plan, which is providing an ongoing support to education stakeholders' response to the pandemic. We've seen how a collaboration with mobile operators is, is really vital during this research. Um, so both startups and, and ministries of education um, have ramped up partnership with mobile operators to increase access to digital services. Um, so to give you an example, uh, we have a, a really strong partnership that is happening between uh, Bahati Airtel, uh, partnering with EdTech startup Latu Media, which enabled um, you know, them to scale uh, their, I mean, to distribute the quality learning material from Latu Kids. And um, they, they were able to benefit uh, from Airtel 160 million monthly active users um, across their digital platforms. So this type of partnership is, is, is really um, is happening a lot. And uh, the other type of partnership that does help them scale the solution is when they partner with the UNICEF. Um, and it, it helps provide children access to remote learning, but also cash assistance to their family. Um, the partnership uses basically mobile technology, and it benefited 133 million school-age children in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this was also including zero rating. Um, so Airtel Africa zero rated um, selecting e-learning platform um, and enab enabling remote access at no cost. It is also very important to use basic mobile uh, solution. Uh, startups that, that use um, basic mobile channels are the one uh, who had the greatest potential to reach uh, those living um, at the bottom of the pyramid. 
Uh, one company, which is also one of our grantees, is Eneza Education. Um, they they provide, um, you know, uh, it's an tech company operating in Kenya, Ghana, and Ivory Coast. And they use this SMS-based tech solution that can be accessed via feature form. So as of today, um, the solution has um, over 6 million learners and also students that used um, Eneza education during nine months have um, seen an, imp an improvement in academic performance by 23% according to our research. Partnership with mobile, between mobile operators and, and media broadcast can be particularly helpful um, when it comes to reaching the masses. Um, so we've seen how powerful can EdTech solution be when um, an NGO such as Sesame Workshop, predominantly using TV um, to reach children, have adapted the strategy to COVID and started to use digital tools such as mobile to reach children and caregivers through WhatsApp and SMS. But they also developed um, their digital solutions online, yeah, mobile to reach a wider audience. Lastly, we, we all know this, but technology is not a replacement for school. Going to school helped to close the digital and, and gender divide and provide various forms of quotes from academic to social protection. But the digital solution of today can can help us build, um, can, can be really the building blocks for a more resilient education. Um, we've seen education models that succeeded in, in giving hope for developing worlds. Um, we have for this research, for example, spoken to um, a school in, in, a sm in town in Lebanon, where, um, which is the International School of Innovation, uh, where um, the school was offering basically blended learning uh, five years before the before COVID started, so we, with a robust online learning system complementing the the physical classroom. So when COVID struck, they were already prepared, and this type of model can really help um, you know um, those those um, education those ed tech solutions thrive in developing markets. Now, it is important also to learn from this period and, and we'll need data to do so. Um, so, um, so we, we've analyzed, in, I mean, we, if you access our report, we, we have more details in terms of how data can help, um, help us understand how those ed tech, technology solutions were used um, during COVID and until now, in order to improve education models in place and, and in order to help the education system become more resilient to future shocks. So, um, next slide, please. To discuss more on, on that topic, um, we have today with us three important education stakeholders. Um, so, from the EdTech Hub, uh, Chris McGurney is part of um, the country engagement team. Um, the Hub brings together British universities, research companies, and, and education experts to help teachers and governments make a better informed decision in terms of their EdTech strategy. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Kinda, and um, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Chris McGurney, and as Kinda mentioned, I work at the EdTech Hub. The EdTech Hub is a global research partnership that aims to support policymakers to use evidence when making decisions about educational technology. At the moment, I am currently based in Freetown in Sierra Leone, where I'm providing technical assistance to the government with technology and education. And outside of my work with the Sierra Leonean government, I've supported the EdTech Hub's help desk which effectively provides discrete advice uh, to education advisors at the World Bank and the FCDO, or the British government. And I've also contributed to a number of publications, including a uh, recent uh, background paper on EdTech for the Save Our Future campaign. And before we begin, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everyone who's joining from across a number of different time zones. I just say that I'm very excited to be part of this discussion. Thanks, Kinder. Thank you, Chris. 
Great to have you on board. Uh, we also have today with us Oisin Walton, which is Instant Network Program Manager at the Vodafone Foundation. Um, this is an organization aiming really to utilize innovative mobile technology uh, to mobilize social change and um, improve people's lives. So, hello, Oisin, and welcome. Hello, Kinda. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, and hello, everyone. So I'm Oshin Walton, and I manage uh, Vodafone Group Foundation's Emergency Response and Connected Education programs. Uh, Vodafone Foundation is the charitable arm of the global telecoms company uh, that many of you will know. Uh, we work with charity partners, uh, combining our grant giving, technology, and employee volunteers to uh, help some um, help address some of the the most pressing issues in the world. And this afternoon, I'll be sharing insight into uh, our Instant Network Schools program, uh, which aims at improving quality education for refugees and host communities in partnership with UNHCR, the UN uh, Refugee Agency. Uh, the program has uh, so far benefited over 85,000 refugees, and we're aiming to improve learning outcomes for uh, more than 500,000 students from refugee and host communities by 2025. So thank you very much for having me uh, uh, today, Kinda, and uh, look forward to uh, to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Austin, and welcome. And from Toronto, we have Tarek Fancy, which is the founder and CEO of the Rumi Initiative, or Rumi, uh, which is a nonprofit ed tech um, focusing on removing barriers for learning in in underserved communities around the world. Uh, welcome, Tarek. Thank you, Kinda. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Rumi, the best way to think about us is that we use the latest technology to make learning easy, accessible, and fun for underserved communities. Um, we've been doing it for a number of years now. We work uh, through partners in uh, over 30 countries, and uh, our model has been historically that uh, we would have a solution that could be implemented by partners on the ground that's used by UNICEF in the Middle East for um, refugee programs, by Junior Achievement in East Africa for job skills and other things. Um, and uh, this year, actually, we've pushed to sort of the, the biggest upgrade we've had in our history to uh, sort of an evolution that is a, a, of our solution based on micro learning, which all of our data and experience uh, uh, told us and is showing has very high engagement and impact. And it also makes the um, solution available directly to uh, learners. Okay, thank you, Tari. Um, great. So I'd like to to begin our discussion today. And um, the first question that I, I'm really interested in, in asking, um, perhaps uh, we can start with the EdTech Hub. Um, since Chris, you've been involved in, in um, with the EdTech Hub in, in multiple research on the ground, um, I, I would like to ask you what were the biggest disruption you've seen perhaps in, in the past year or so or a fundamental game-changing innovation you believe can make a difference in, in education and particularly in online learning um, and uh, do you believe that those are still valid after COVID struck? Sure um, so this is a great question and um, yeah I'm really glad that you've asked this and I think uh, in response to this question, I'm going to uh, touch on some of the works that I've been doing with the government in Sierra Leone. Um, and what I see is one very promising use of technology and education technology. And I think if we're going to live up to the rhetoric of building back better, we need to use this kind of educational hiatus as an opportunity to explore ways to use tech to support the wider education system and to really strengthen the system. And I really liked how your report emphasized the importance of developing this kind of robust ecosystem, including the use of tech uh, for data collection. And at the moment, uh, one of the areas that I'm supporting the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary Education in Sierra Leone is to use digital approaches to collect school and student level data. And just as a bit of background context, um, schools in Sierra Leone, Rio, and uh, Leon went, oh, reopened um, on October the 5th. Um, and the basic idea is at the moment is that the schools will use a mobile device, um, such as a tablet, although and I've seen mobile phones being used as well. Uh, and this will be collecting information on things such as teacher qualification, uh, student numbers, uh, the teacher background. 
And all of this data will be effectively relayed and collected in a central database and dashboard. And the idea is that this will then help decision makers to target the interventions more equitably. Um, so for example, one real challenge is how do you um, know that resources or even quality teachers are being um, distributed to uh, specific provinces? And this is one of the areas that uh, we've seen kind of that could potentially start moving the dial a little bit. And in many ways, I view Sierra Leone's uh, MBSC as a pioneer in this area. Um, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this particular example today is I think that data collection and analysis is an area where mobile network operators in particular can play a really important role, given their capacity to A, collect data on how individuals use their devices, and also B, how their, um, their capacity to subsidize or zero rate um, the cost of using internet to um, conduct these initiatives. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear from the other panels, panelists as well. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, indeed, pr proliferation of, of low-cost device, um, particularly feature phone, um, we've seen how it has the potential to, to really provide learning opportunities. Um, and in some way, they are a game changer. Um, so, Oisin, um, how, how much is it the case when, when it comes to, um, you know, to your work on the ground with refugees? How, how do you feel that um, mobile technology in particular has helped scale those solutions, um, you know, via perhaps the instant school program that you're managing? Thanks, Kinder. Uh, that's a, it's a very wide question. Um, but I would say uh, definitely, I mean, mobile technology is a, is, is a game changer. And I, I think that many, many teachers and parents will have realized that so over the last, uh, uh, last few months. Um, but I would say, I, I think, you know, in terms of affordability, for example, of mobile devices becoming uh, cheaper, for example, uh, yes, that's definitely a, a factor of improvement and, and uh, provides uh, increased learning opportunities. But uh, whether in school or home, home, home learning, for example. But I think um, uh, devices only based programs, for example, have rarely worked. Um, at Vodafone Foundation, uh, with the Instant Network Schools program, for example, we've taken a holistic approach. So we're using technology. Um, as part of an end-to-end -end solution, and uh, we're using technology to improve learning outcomes rather than learn learning about technology, which comes effectively along the way. Um, so providing power, connectivity, hardware, dedicated staff in the schools, uh, digital education content, uh, teacher training on how to use the technology, and then how to integrate the technology into the classroom. Um, uh, so increasing coverage, making connectivity more affordable, having digital content, matching local curriculum, um, teacher training and improving the overall infrastructure in the classrooms are, are key. So it's, I'd say today it's less, um, uh, it's less about the technology than actually bringing, uh, uh, joining forces and uh, bringing all these different elements uh, uh, together. The technology is available the report highlights it very well, um, and um, I think mobile operators such as Vodafone are, are playing playing a, playing their role. Um, we can certainly do more, but I think it's the the overall ecosystem that uh, really needs to come together to to achieve SDG four. Can you can you get us through? Um, give us a bit more details about how what were the key partnerships that helped you achieve this um, holistic approach. So um, we, we or, partnered with the UNH. Sorry, go ahead, mm -hmm. Kinda. Sorry. No, I, I meant you, you have partners um, in terms of your content, and then partners for uh, your power, uh, and then for the hardware part. So it would be good to give us a bit of details about how you managed to achieve holistic approach, and which was the key success factor for for instant school programs. Absolutely. Um, well, originally what we did is first we did an assessment with UNHCR looking at what were the needs in, in camps around education and what were the challenges uh, and then what 
was done in ed tech in, in that space. Um, and uh, the solution we came up was uh, with providing an end-to-end -end with connectivity, power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, Vodafone is a company specialized in connectivity and, and, uh, uh, and telecoms. Um, we're not a power company. Uh, we don't uh, develop digital content, et cetera, et cetera. So we built on our partnership with UNHCR to bring on partners such as Huawei, who provided devices, tablets for free that we could include in our instant classroom kit that we developed for, uh, for the schools. Uh, we brought in partners such as MilliWeb, which is a software company in France who uh, work with the Ministry of Education in France and work recognized uh, software company. They provided a, a tool that enables teachers to uh, create their own lessons and create a lesson bank among teachers. Um, so we, we looked at every different component and looked at who are the partners who can uh, uh, contribute to this, uh, to this program. Um, we're still not there yet and we'll welcome any uh, you, you know any any goodwill and, and partners out there who want to uh, to join, um, but certainly yes, the, the message is no one can do this alone. Um, uh, yes, we're big companies, we can do a lot, but I think it's uh, 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 way beyond uh, anyone's reach uh, altogether. So we need to, uh, we absolutely need to work in partnership in, in this case. Absolutely, technology alone, as you said. Um... We, can, we cannot achieve much with just the technology. Um, so next I'd like to ask um, Tarek, um, we, we often refer to, to the importance of providing solutions adapted to the market, right? And um, when we, we target developing countries, um, how do you believe micro learning in particular can make a difference? Um, and and um, to what extent uh, do you believe this can particip participate in bridging uh, digital gaps, skill gap, and gender gaps. Thanks, Kendo. I'm going to share a few slides that I hope everyone could see uh, as I'm answering uh, this question. So the way I would answer that is that we uh, began at Rumi in terms of thinking about how we could bring the free digital learning revolution to the offline world. And I'll, these slides, I'll just go through them very quickly just to explain a bit about my, what microlearning is. But through the early years of, of, of working in these communities, we originally had uh, um, you know, a, a, a third party hardware solution for partners um, that they could use. And then over time, we phased that out because we found that in most communities, they do have devices available. Um, sometimes they need them, but they're best locally sourced for, for customs and, and, and you know, uh, uh, maintenance and other, other reasons. But they had the devices, but what we found was a challenge was that um, you know, in, in these communities, people have demands on their time. And um, and oftentimes in underserved communities, they have less leisure time. And so you need to sort of be able to help people um, uh, learn by making it easy and fun. And so we found that what we, people really wanted through our experience in 30 plus countries was number one, they wanted stuff that was small snippets that they could use um, whenever they had a few minutes. And secondly, they wanted it to be very practical, right? Uh, more around job and, and life skills and things that they felt had connection to um, what they what they needed in their lives. And so I'll explain what micro learning is really quickly by actually changing gears for a second and talking about social media. Some of you may seen, have seen a recent documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. It talks about the mental negative mental health effects of social media on society. One of the most fascinating things about social media is how these companies take your time. The average Instagram session is six and a half minutes. It's that exactly that boredom period where someone's waiting for a bus or they have a few minutes before this or that. They have a mobile device they pulled out and they use social media. The challenge is that that aggregates to a lot of time per day. And what's fascinating is that it's even higher in some emerging markets. So the highest country in the world today is the Philippines with nearly four hours per day because as people got mobile devices, um, the first companies to just spend billions of dollars trying to reach them uh, were the social media companies. And for youth and lower income people globally, the smartphone is their computer of choice. And so they were bombarded and they became early social media users. When we looked at what social media was doing, we knew there was something that we could learn from it because much of the education space has traditionally been very formal, a formal K-12 sort of setting. And they were focused primarily on thinking about quality only. The high quality learning materials and experiences 
result and impact. And what I think a lot of EdTech players have learned, particularly since the COVID lockdowns began, was that if you start to operate through technology, quality is not enough. Quality is enough if you have a classroom where kids are stuck in, you know, it's seven minutes into a one hour lecture, the lecture's boring, they can't really leave, right? There's social expectations, parental expectations, maybe they've paid tuition, whatever it is, they're, they're captive. But when you go to technology, it becomes a bit of a different uh, consideration because you're accessing someone on their device and they have a lot of alternatives. And if your content is boring seven minutes in, a kid will close it and load TikTok. And that exists in any market, um, rich countries or, or not. And so what we're being very focused on is how do we take what we've done around quality and drive engagement around it and, and do it in a way that, so, that, that we compete with the best of what social media has to offer. And in doing so, make learning as fun and, and easy as social media. And so we'll focus heavily on the engagement piece, and that led us to micro learning, which I would think of as being, you know, you have things that people need, right? They, they need to learn basic skills for their lives, and you have things that they want. And all of us are the same. We want to be entertained. We want to do things that are interesting, and we veer towards those. And so our latest uh, sort of our evolution of, of product is really around uh, micro learning, precisely because the data has shown and, and all of our traction now is showing that it gets much higher engagement. Um, and it's exactly around what people need. And what's fascinating is that the early studies on micro learning show that it's over 20 percent more effective in terms of learner retention than an equivalent amount of time spent in a traditional format. Uh, not to mention, I'd say the most important part is that because it's in short snippets, people in the aggregate spend a lot more time in total actually doing it. I just finished by saying um, we call our micro learning courses Bytes. Uh, and the three sources of Bytes that we have today are a, a growing and vibrant volunteer community. I was, it's a bit similar to Wikipedia, but it's not in the sense that we actually know who all the people are and vet them. And also the content gets vetted before any Byte goes on the platform. Uh, a new avenue we've created our celebrity experts. Uh, so Chris Field, uh, the astronaut, just created a bite that we, we released in the last week. And the final area is corporate volunteers. And um, this is around job and life skills. We've had employees from Amazon, Carlyle Group, Manulife, you know, a whole bunch of companies, uh, all since COVID lockdowns began, creating bites that are aligned to specific areas of expertise that they have uh, to deliver to these communities. And we've found the uptake to be very, uh, a, a very impressive so far, mainly because it's made easy for them and because they, they find the, the, the bytes to be high quality. So I'll finish on that <laughs> note, but um, if you want to know micro learning is the easiest way is just to go to roomy.org, um, including on your phone since it's mobile first and, um, and try out a few bytes yourself. Thank you, Tara, very interesting. Um, are you able to tell us now, we are 10 months through COVID, were learners comfortable, um, you know, how comfortable were learners using these online learning solutions? What do you think were the main obstacles? Although it was, for example, in this case, micro learning, how, what were the main access, like obstacles for them accessing and, and truly benefiting from the solution? I think one of the biggest challenges that we have noted in the space is the, is the, is the equation I mentioned about quality and, uh, and engagement. It's the fact that um, education technology in some cases has been done in a very top-down, uh, supply-driven or almost paternalistic fashion. And so if you think about it, now here in Ontario, we're based in Canada, uh, the educational system generally gets pretty good reviews um, globally and has high you know, test scores. Um, but one of the challenges was that the Ministry of Education wasn't ready when no one was ready when COVID happened. And so they took a whole bunch of content for the curriculum, they put it online, and then they said, okay, now everyone can access it. And the reality is that um, a student, if they're in the classroom and forced to do it, they'll, they'll do it because they have no other option. Um, if they're sitting at home and you've taken a textbook and made that textbook into a PDF, and now you've said, now that PDF's available on your phone, it's a completely different ballgame because technically it is education technology. You have supplied it in the sense of checking a box. In reality, I don't know many young people who would prefer to read a textbook PDF on their phone rather than watch a TikTok video. And so the, so the dynamic changes because you're reaching someone through a device where they're not in the setting where they're forced to do it. They can do three minutes. They can do 20 minutes. You know, it's, it's a mobile device. And so the, the entire dynamic changes and you really need, I think, to, to think about how to engage people when you're honestly competing against some very 
uh, entertaining and a lot more addictive uh, alternatives that um, that you didn't have to worry about when it was a captive audience in a classroom because you know the teacher could just say like no phones and that's the end. Yes, engagement is, is definitely uh, an important aspect. Now, Ocean, in, in terms of the obstacle to access the technology and to benefit from it, uh, could you please give us a bit more understanding what is the case in, in refugee settings? Sure. Um, well, j just I uh, just want to add a comment on, on what was uh, said, what Tariq was saying, and I'd be interested uh, at some stage either on this this uh, uh, webinar or another one to understand a bit how this would work in a in a classroom setting. I mean, most kids, uh, when this whole crisis ends, and we, I think the it comes back to the model of education that we're hoping for in the future and what we want school to be about or learning the learning experience how how does it work in a in a classroom setting i completely get it and i uh you know i, I the the uh, micro learning is is uh uh you know definitely the way forward uh for home learning and in their own time but I'd be interested, and in, it's probably for another conversation, uh, uh, Tariq. But how 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 does it work when you have thirty kids in the classroom, a teacher? What's the role of the teacher, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, but really, really interesting. Um, coming back to your question, Kinda, obviously uh, in refugee camps there are huge challenges around infrastructure, lack of um, lack of classrooms, overcrowded classrooms, and when I say Overcrowded. I mean, I don't mean 30 or 40. I mean 100, 120 students with uh, kids sitting outside, uh, listen, trying to listen in. Um, teachers having fewer, few books. Um, high turnover of teachers uh, because the conditions are quite uh, tough. Um, and that's where uh, it's really interesting because the the mobile coverage is there in many many camps and i'm thinking of you know uh, uh in many many camps in in africa and certainly the ones where we we're operating in kenya tanzania congo there's mobile coverage um access to devices is still a challenge uh, the model that we've uh taken is uh, uh is create a space in the school where um uh, you put in hardware, connectivity, etc., but you create a space for teachers to bring their class in to that classroom to run an interactive class. We put in the infrastructure into one classroom. We're not distributing a tablet to every child. Um, so at each class gets a few hours per uh, week uh, uh, running an interactive class. They can do um, research online after, after school hours because obviously the infrastructure is there 24 seven. So they make, really make the most of it. And once you put in the infrastructure and once it's there, there's all sorts of things happening, whether it's, uh, you, you talked about um, um, helping with gender, gender uh, balance. So uh, in terms of access for uh, ICT boot camps for girls, for example, um, whether it's edutaining, um, uh, Tariq mentioned about having fun. Having fun is part of, you know, a big part of uh, education. Um, it brings a whole range of opportunities when the infrastructure is there, and the the creativity of refugees is just amazing uh, in, in those camps. So, uh, and it's it's pretty amazing to see um, uh, refugees mix with locals, and I can take the the example of Kikuma refugee camp, where there's probably 20 plus nationalities. It's amazing to see uh, all these different cultures, these different people from around the world um, uh, uh, blending and, and, and learning together and each bringing their own uh, uh, qualities to uh, to the learning process. Interesting. Um, Tarek, would you, like, would you like to comment um, a bit on, on how micro learning can be integrated in classroom? I think it can be interesting for all. Yeah, well, um, what I would say is that our original solutions that, that we still run with around the world are, are tend to be a bit more classroom based, which uh, as I, I had referenced in the beginning that partner organizations, UNICEF, Junior Achievement, Right to Play, Plan, they all use it in different uh, countries. Um, micro learning, I would, I would view as being a bit supplemental to that. Um, the truth is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of the data shows also for 
people in underserved communities, they get less hours of classroom time in general a day. I would say actually less access because it's, cl it's classroom time and then it's also extracurriculars and access to all sorts of other things that are available in more affluent countries. And so there is a tremendous untapped opportunity in supplemental learning when people have access to devices and so on that um, it, it's not just that it's, it has to be necessarily more effective than the classroom equivalent, it's just that it adds hours on. And so that's one of the big focused areas of ours has been that, um, is that there's a tremendous amount of uh, impact potential that can be unlocked if you can give people access to do it on their own time. And we've found that, you know, with programs we're running with, with Roshan, uh, for example, uh, as a mobile operator in Afghanistan, uh, for, in the programs for girls and women's education, what we've found is that they tend to um, have less access in general because they have various restrictions that mean that they're underserved in the first place. And of course, they now anyway aren't in a classroom because of COVID in the same way. But I would I would say that it's sort of I would view it as really supplemental and complementary in many ways to what you would do in a classroom, and, and the both can work very well together to to unlock a lot of impact. Okay, thank you very much for um, for precising how it works more as a complement. Um, now I would like to ask uh, Sam, which is with us. Um, so Sam is is um, senior manager, insight manager um, in the CIU team at JSMA. And um, I think it would be very interesting to get his insight uh, since he has work um, on the startup side. He, he worked closely with our grantees, um, Eneza Education and, and Ruanguru. Um, so Eneza, um, I mentioned earlier in West Africa, and Ruanguru in Indonesia. Um, so Sam, would you be able to summarize uh, what do you think for each uh, were the, the key success factors for scaling the solutions on the ground? Yeah. Thanks, Kinda, and um, yeah, it's good to take part. Really insightful uh, information being shared by all the all the panelists. Maybe quickly touching on Ineza. So, just brief context: Ineza is a is an edtech solution uh, which is currently operational in Kenya, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and and most recently Rwanda. And it essentially runs on a a basic SMS and USSD solution where students uh, can access lessons and quizzes on on any mobile platform, you know, using technologies, these uh, basic technologies, SMS and USSD. Um, so they work uh, in uh, in terms of payments. Payments is usually made through, through mobile money, and this is collected weekly or, or monthly. Um, and Ranguru is is a is a company, a their tech company based in Indonesia, um, which essentially helps. Uh, bridge that connections between uh, teachers and, and students. Um, they've actually rolled out, they've been fairly successful, um, particularly during COVID, uh, with you know their numbers increasing as many other ed tech startups. Um, for for Eneza, which I didn't touch on actually, Eneza really plans on reaching five million users uh, by by 2022. And Eneza has been fairly successful in actually reaching a number of users. So COVID has obviously been beneficial for both companies. Um, they have 17 million students in, in Indonesia who are active on the platform. Um, the key to success with both companies, look at both companies, uh, you see that they focus on one, they have this multi-stakeholder um, approach where they're working very closely with the ministries of health working very closely with um, with, with our, our mobile operator partners. Um, and for them, it's bridging that access uh, gap. How can they get to the end user, uh, which is students? The second point is they understand their customers really well. Um, what I've found with these companies is that they understand that there are times when it's not students that they need to reach. They need to find out how to reach their parents. Uh, they think, should they work with uh, you know, uh, teachers unions or should they? So they, they really understand who the end users is. So I'll stop there, but those are the two points where I think um, they, they've been able to. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, one of the key takeaway of, of our research referred to how tech solutions are, are really the building blocks of future blended learning or current blended learning already that because we have different system in place. Um, so, um, Chris, how much do you believe that um, 
you know, the solutions of today can help build, build resilience in, in, in future shocks. Um, and um, how do you think, you know, throughout your research, and, and um, I'm sure there is a, a research currently trying to assess uh, this particular aspect of understanding the usage of edX solution in order to um, strengthen um, the education system and, and make it become more inclusive by, by increasing our understanding how this was used during this, this period. Um, would you like to comment sure. on that? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm really glad that you uh, raised this topic as the issue of preparedness and resilience has been a constant feature of the kind of discourse in education since schools began to close. And um, as you mentioned, um, and I also know you highlighted in your report as well about the importance of a, a new and um, more resilient uh, blended approach to education as part of this kind of new norm going forward. And this is something that actually my colleagues and I at the EdTech Hub recently published a paper on as we were looking at possible uses of technology as part of a uh, kind of a new education norm um, with a particular focus on sub-Saharan Africa. And when we were reflecting on the lessons and learnings from the pandemic, some of which have been touched on today. So we mentioned the challenge of access to devices, uh, the challenge of engagement. Um, we recognize the need to draw on multiple modalities and multiple forms of technology and also non-technological means um, to deliver education to the largest number of children and especially the most marginalized uh, children and the most vulnerable. And for me, this lesson should inform how we use technology as part of a blended approach after the crisis. And really it suggests that we may need to potentially expand our conceptualization, uh, conceptualization of uh, what blended learning is beyond kind of a conventional viewpoint that focuses on a mix of online and face-to-face -face teaching. And if we think critically about tech in even at quite a high level, um, it can become apparent that the combination of just online and face-to-face -face may not be cost-effective in countries where many children lack digital literacy, many learners have um, less access to uh, advanced or more advanced technological resources. Um, and I think a more flexible approach to blended learning and which could support kind of the resilience of the wider system would be to start to focus on low cost and low tech alternatives that don't necessarily require internet connectivity. And for example, in the study that my colleagues and I uh, conducted, we found that uh, basic mobile phones um, and SMS messaging programs have been a reasonably cost-effective approach to blended learning in countries such as Malawi, Rwanda, Senegal. Um, and I'm emphasizing the use of mobile phones given uh, the platform, but other potential options could include radio, educational television, and potentially a mix of all the these kind of different low-tech and uh, low-cost uh, options. Uh, I think kind of just to end, I think kind of really what ultimately matters is that we use and deploy technologies that the most marginalized students can actually access and use. Um, I think this is the only way that we're going to make sure that we don't leave um, the most marginalized behind. Thank you very much. And um, since we are already running out of time, and, and this is a shame because it's a very interesting um, discussion, but a large topic, we had in one of our one of the questions in the Q&A section uh, asking more details about, you know, this UNICEF partnership um, that was mentioned. Um, would you like to comment on, on um, how, you know, um, they can have more information on the partnership? Sorry, Kendra, I'm not sure if that was directed at me or sorry what partnership are we it's is the question probably for Tarek I think that's for Tarek oh I can take that I wasn't actually sure either I, I, I put an answer in the actual uh, okay thank box. you for this yeah so um, from uh, there may be other things going on with UNICEF so I don't want to presuppose it was about us but um, they have a project that they're doing with Microsoft called the learning passport um, and we've uh, been working with them so that all of the bytes available on roomy.org, again, which anyone could just go and try right now from your desktop or phone, uh, are all open and free. And so those will all be um, available through the Learning Passport. 
it was, it's a vehicle for them to get more content because we're building an engine uh, around that. And we, you know, it's all open and free. So we want to see additional um, uh, impact around that. And, um, and there's, a, there's a lot of potential to have it, uh, you know, we're building an SMS delivery, frankly, and uh, very soon. And the way we made it easy to do that, I'd say is by making it extremely bandwidth efficient and simple so that these can be delivered to a featured phone for very little data charge. And then showing uh, users um, and mobile operators that their customers want this. And there's a big difference between saying people need this as very top down and the mobile operators say, great, okay, they need it. We're saying that they want it and say that, hey, customers really like this. They've tested it, want more of it. Because any mobile operator will say they're for-profit organizations and they'll say, okay, well, it costs me very little because it's very bandwidth efficient and it's, you know, it's, it, data charges are going down for them because of the improvement in infrastructure and their customers want this. And so there's a benefit to them from a customer relationship and stickiness and everything else perspective. And so there's a bit of a sweet spot there where you can provide value, I would say, um, to, to uh, communities, but, but doing it in a way that also meets the needs of a mobile operator and makes it more likely that they're willing to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, yes, and so, sorry, Chris, yes, that was directed to, to Tarek. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time, um, and I would like to conclude um, this discussion with saying that now is the time to, to size the moment, um, and time of crisis are um, the times where, where we have the greatest amount of change and, and, and where the greatest amount of change is possible. Um, so I really see that as a, as a window of opportunity. Uh, the challenge now, and we discussed that, is, is how to take those small scales innovation and apply them scale that they, they are inclusive and, and able to reach students of um, different learning standards and contexts. Um, so policymakers today have actually the chance uh, to, to create the environment, um, nurture the regulatory environment um, that they close those innovations. Um, and that was really well. Um, stated that innovations bubble from um, the ground up and not uh, from, uh, I mean, the time for innovation coming from top down is, is really over. And um, if nothing else, um, COVID has really sh demonstrated that. Um, so thank you all for um, your time and for participating to this very interesting discussion and collaborating on the research. Um, Tom, if we can just go back to the last slide of the presentation so that the audience can um, access uh, the report if they didn't get a chance to, to get the link. Um, otherwise, for all the, the interesting questions that, that we received, we will make sure to reply to them uh, very soon. And uh, we, we were not able, unfortunately, to answer them all. Um, so let's see if, if we can have um, the last slide. Um, with the report. Um, yes, please make sure um, uh, you, you download the report and, and you can have, you know, all the links of the research mentions and, and all the details of, of the partnership and, and the key insight for today's session. Uh, thank you all and um, have a great day and hopefully uh, further sessions throughout um, further analysis, further work and further uh, discussion like this one. Thank you.